Good morning, guys. How are you doing today? You guys feeling all right? I'm feeling good up here as well. I'm so glad that you guys are here. And I want to start off by asking you guys a, a simple question. Um, have you ever had a moment in your life, or maybe it's a, a season of life, uh, where you felt like you're out of place for one reason or another? Maybe it's like a friend group or a social situation where you just feel like you don't belong, you don't really fit in. Maybe that's you and you're feeling that way now, your first time here in this room, and you feel like you don't belong, you don't fit in for one reason or another. Raise your hands if you've ever felt that way before. Okay, most of us have experienced something similar. Uh, so a few weeks back, uh, my wife Mariah and I were able to go to New York City for a few nights um, just to kind of explore the city. Mariah's never been to New York City before. I've been a few times, but not since I was a young kid. Uh, so this was kind of a new experience for the, for the both of us. And we kind of saw New York City in a, in a different way. So I, I have a picture up there. Uh, one of these pictures is from our hotel room view. It's the Empire State Building right there, which was pretty cool. Uh, and we went out exploring New York and when we first got there, this was the view that we went through, and it was raining as we were driving through the city. And the first thing I can say, if you've been to New York City, if you've never been, is that New York City is every stereotype that you can think about when it comes to New York City is, is probably true. We, we pulled in and drove through the Lincoln Tunnel, and everyone's like beeping at each other and yelling. There's like trash on the street, and I'm like driving. I'm intimidated because like there's all these tall buildings. I don't know where I'm going, and it's raining. Everyone's beeping at me. I'm like, don't yell at me, please. And everyone's just going crazy in New York City. And then the next day, we decide that we're going to start exploring. We went to the top of the Empire State Building. I think there's a picture up there behind me as well of us taking a picture up there. And the one thing you don't want to do when you're in New York City, and I don't know why this is, but you never want to feel like a tourist anytime you go anyplace. Has anyone ever felt that way before? Like, you don't want people to know that you don't belong here. Does anyone have, have ever experienced that before? Like, you don't want to take pictures, so you quickly take a picture so nobody sees you, so it doesn't seem like this is your first time here, and you're like walking, and you're trying to not check your phone with your maps on it so people think you know where you're going. You don't want to feel like you don't belong there. So we spend this whole uh, weekend exploring New York City, and our first day there, we're trying to figure out the subway system, which is confusing if you don't know what you're doing. And we saw three giant rats running across the subway system. Nobody else seemed to mind, but these things were just running all over the place. We went to Times Square and there was a dude who was playing a guitar and nothing but a cowboy hat and tidy whities I did not put a picture up there of that one for obvious reasons. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so New York City, everything about it, and very quickly, it was a great time. The, the energy and vibe in New York City is awesome. But very quickly, we both realized, hey, we're not cut out for this, right? Like, we don't fit in here. This is not who we are. Some of you guys are like, yeah, I love New York. But for us, we very quickly realized that we were not where we belonged. We liked Rochester, small city. We liked kind of where we are here. And oftentimes, we feel that way, don't we? And I think that this is more of a pressing question or a pressing concern for our lives more often. Now, it feels sometimes as if our Christian life or if our faith sometimes doesn't belong here. Have you ever got the sense and the feeling that, that the, the things that we believe, the person of Jesus that we follow, that scripture sometimes feels like it doesn't belong? And this can be a very, very intimidating feeling. And over the past few weeks, we've been studying the book of 1 Peter. And, and the Peter, the apostle Peter, who followed Jesus, one of his 12 disciples, he's writing this book to a group of believers, a group of churches who feel like they're out of place, like they don't fit in with the world around them. So we're going to look at a passage here. Uh, this next passage, and, and Steve talked about the one previously, and they tie in close together, but we're going to talk about this next passage, and I want us to look at two different things. The first thing is this. Peter is going to give us a whole list of things, of things that we should stay away from. He's going to say, these are the things that we should not do as followers of Jesus. For those who are living in a different culture, in a different world, these are the things that we should stay away from. And then he's going to point to something else and say that these are the things that we should do, but more importantly, who we should be. So this is really important as we look into this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this passage, and I want to warn you, this passage is a little hot. It's got some pretty serious themes in it. So I want to warn you before we go into this, and you might be thinking as we read this passage, you know what, this is why I don't like the Bible. This is why I don't like faith. This is why I don't like scripture. And if that's you, I want to say I'm so glad you're here, and I want you to bear with me because 
I think this could bring a lot of encouragement and hope to every single one of us. Are you guys ready to read this passage? Okay, the three people over there, I'm gonna read it for you guys right there. All right, this is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and uh, detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join in in their reckless living, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was prepared even to those who are now dead, so that they may be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Tough passage here. So Peter's writing this passage to a group of people, and this is really important for us to understand. In this time period that Peter and these people are living, they just experienced incredibly terrible persecution from the Roman government. This is the time, if you remember world history from high school, this is the time where Emperor Nero was in charge in Rome. Spoiler alert, he was not a good guy, not a fun guy to hang around with at all. And he went in, and for one reason or another, there's a couple things that led to these events, but he went into Jerusalem and absolutely destroyed Jerusalem, tore down the Jewish temple and started the most significant and widespread persecution of the Jewish people and the Christian people that they have ever seen and probably more than we've ever seen since then. And what happened is, is that these people, we know from 1 Peter chapter 1 that, that they went into exiles and they scattered all throughout the world into every corner, every aspect of the world. These new group of people who are called Christians now spread into every area of the world. And now they are quickly finding, they are quickly finding that the world looks different than what they are, are familiar with. This letter is believed to be uh, written about 10 to 20 years after the events of, of the persecution or the destruction of the Jew, or Jewish temple. And, and they are now in an area where they are in cultures and in societies that do not line up with, with how God has called them to live or what God has called them into. And how many of you guys know that that can be an absolutely terrifying situation? So they're experiencing persecution, they're experiencing suffering like nothing else that they've ever seen before. And last week, if you were not here, Steve talked about how, how we are supposed to suffer. Sometimes we suffer for doing good. And, and Peter starts to, to write this and he, he says, now this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what it might actually look like to suffer for doing good. And all of a sudden things get real, real, real and important. So why is this important to us? Why do we care what, what, what Peter wrote all those thousands of years ago? Why is this important to us? How many of you guys have started to realize that the teaching of scripture is not always popular here in our world? How many of you guys have started to realize that saying that Jesus is the only way to God is, is sometimes offensive? How many of you have realized that to live a godly lifestyle, to love others, to put yourself humbly before other people, to serve their needs more than your own is not a popular lifestyle and that's not what gets you to the top in our world. And to be clear, I don't think we're experiencing anything close to what these guys experienced back in the day in the early church. I don't think we've come anywhere close to the persecution that they feel. However, it's not a stretch to say that our faith that the message of scripture, the story of the gospel is not always the most popular theme or conversation in our world. Would you guys tend to agree with that sometimes? So how are we as Christians supposed to live in this culture that sometimes rejects the teachings and, and the way and the life of Jesus? How are we supposed to live? And I wanna, I wanna put together this first point here. Jesus asks us to surrender our plans for his purpose. He requires us to surrender our plans for his purpose. Verse two says this, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human evil desires, but rather for the will of God. 
And this is one of the most difficult parts of, of the Christian faith. It's this idea that I'm going to surrender the things that I want. I'm going to surrender my own plans, my own desires in order that God can get what he wants here in our world. And if you've ever tried that, that's easy to think about, that's easy to say, but it's not so easy to put in practice. But it's this, this crucial point of the, of the Christian faith that I'm going to surrender the things that I want in order to get what God wants instead. It's the idea that he, that Jesus is going to be the leader Leader, the director of my life, and I am going to humbly take a backseat and allow him to direct my life. And this is one of the most controversial and biggest hangups that people have with, with Jesus today. People, the biggest mindset that we have now is I want to live my life the way that I want to live my life. Who are you to tell me to live my wife, life this way? I'm going to be the leader, the director of my life. I'm not going to allow anybody else to tell me what to do. This is such a popular thought in our world today. I'm going to live this way because I want to. And, and people have this problem with God. And you might even be here and you might even be thinking that yourself. Like, why is God so restrictive? Why doesn't he just allow me to have fun? Why can't I just live my life the way that I want to? Why does it matter? Why does God put these rules and these boundaries in place? What difference does it make? Why can't I just do whatever I want and God just leave me alone? The Olympics are coming up uh, this next week, and I'll be honest, I'm not, not a huge fan of the Olympics, but I really do like swimming because there's like 1,400 events uh, that go on through swimming. And wouldn't it be crazy, Michael Phelps is not in it this year, but if he was, wouldn't it be crazy if the Olympics started, the whistle blew and everything, and instead of Michael Phelps going through the pool and swimming to the other side like everybody else, he got up out of the pool and ran across to the other side like, and just ran around the boundary like, like your 10-year-old kid will do at the public pool, and then they give him the gold medal at the end. Wouldn't that be crazy? And nobody in their right mind say, well, he won it fair and square, right? No, and, and the, here's my point in this, that when we look at something like, like swimming or a competitive sport, there are boundaries in play. There are rules and guidelines in play. Why? Is it because we want to restrict freedom to the athletes and to the people who are trying to be competitive? No, because we recognize that when these boundaries are in place, it doesn't bring uh, less freedom. It brings more freedom because there's the absence of chaos. And oftentimes we feel like freedom means doing whatever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want. That's not freedom, that's chaos. And what God is trying to say is, I have boundaries that I'm setting in place, not because I want to restrict your life, because I know that the most abundant and fulfilling life that you can have is when you are in right relationship with me. And if you step outside of that, it feels like freedom, but it actually leads to more hurt, more destruction, and more pain and chaos in your life than you can ever imagine. And I'm not just saying this. If you have ever lived your life that way, doing whatever you want, you know that that is true and it leads to that. It leads to hurt to your own life, to your family's life, and ultimately it leads to chaos. So God sets up these boundaries for us, not to restrict us, but to lead us more into a fulfilling life with him, full of grace and love and mercy with him. Does that make sense? So Peter is writing to these people and he's telling them, he lists off a whole bunch of, of, of things in this passage and he's telling them, stay away from these things. Don't participate in them. The world around you, everybody that you know is going to act out and live out in this way. And Peter's saying, do not live this way. Do not, do not waste the will of God in your life. Do not waste the purpose of God in your life simply because a temporary desire that has come across your mind. Do not waste the things that God is planning to do in this world because you are, are, are so convinced that your own desires are the best way to go. So he is saying, surrender, surrender your plans, surrender your will for his purposes instead. Surrender your will for his purposes instead. But this is not always, you know, as easy, you know, as it says, right? If you've ever tried this, sometimes it can be difficult to live that different lifestyle. Some of us have lost opportunities from work because we're unwilling to compromise on the things we believe some of us have been laughed at and mocked by our own friends and family who we love deeply because of the things that we believe. It's not always easy. And it can be so tempting to forget what Jesus has called us to do 
to tr simply try to fit in to the culture so that we can get what we want, so that we can have an easier, smoother life. And I need you guys to hear this. I need you to hear this because this is so important. If our only goal is to avoid rejection, our world will never change. If our only goal is to avoid rejection, our world will never change. Our world is not looking for people who are the same as them. They're not looking for people who, who are going to fit in and do exactly the same things that they're participating in. They're not looking for the same. I work with teenagers on a regular basis, seventh and 12th grade. Can I tell you what they are looking for right now? They are looking for something that is true. They are looking for something that is real. They are looking for something that is unshakable. There is a desire and a passion and people are realizing that the things that they have been pursuing, the things they thought would bring them happiness are not working out and they're looking for something something different. And if our only goal is to re avoid rejection, then we will never be able to provide the opportunities to come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. The world is looking for something new. Happiness, joy, peace, healing from their shame and guilt. And as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to be the people that provide that new way of life. If our goal is to only avoid rejection, we will miss out on the purpose and the will that God has right here in Rochester, in Shilai, in our state, in our country. We are looking for something new. It needs followers of Jesus who are going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, not empowered by my own words or my own talents or my own skill set, but empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring a message of hope to a broken and dying world. What could that look like for me and for you if we decided that I was going to say, you know what, I'm done living for the things that I want, but I'm going to surrender my will for God's purpose instead. How much different would my life look like and how much different would our world look like if that were true? What would it look like? And you may be thinking, because I know that this was one of my thoughts that I came across in this. Well, okay, that's something for other people, right? Like there's plenty of people in the church who can do that. There's plenty of people who can go above and beyond in that way. It's not for me. I'm not going to, I, I can't be the one to participate in that. You just don't know my life. I can't do this. And can I tell you this right now? Your life matters. Your actions matter. I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm talking to you. Your life matters. It has value. It has worth. It has power in it because the Holy Spirit is present in your life. You have value. And here, here's why I think this. Verse five says this. It says, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living in the dead. God is holding us to high expectations. He is holding us to high expectations. He is not looking for a church who's going to be the same as everyone else. He is not looking for somebody who will fit into the world around them. He is looking for people who will carry the cross of Jesus, who will go into our world bringing the message of hope. He is looking for an alternative and God will hold us to these expectations and so that he is ready to judge. He is ready to hold us to the level of the things that we put our trust in and the things that we don't put our trust in. If we refuse to follow God, if we say, God, I'm going to do my own thing. I don't care about your plans. I don't care about your will. God will hold us to those expectations. And I don't say that to put a whole bunch of anxiety and pressure on you or to make you fearful. I say that to encourage you because I truly believe that your life makes a difference. It matters in the eyes of God. You are not wasted in that. Can I get an amen, please? Your life matters. So what could it look like for you and for me to put aside my desires, my plans, and say, God, I'm going to allow you to be the one who activates and directs and leads my life? It's a different lifestyle. So it's not simply enough to not do something, right? Right? God isn't asking us to simply just stop doing something and that's it. Like you, you're never supposed to be the type of person that says, well, I didn't, you know, I, I'm not, at least I'm not as bad as that person. Like God calls us to do and to be something 
better. So what does he call, call us to be? And uh, who do, what does he call us to look like? How does he call us to live? Who are the type of people as a followers of Jesus that we're supposed to look like? Uh, back a few years ago, I, for those of who don't know, I, I participate in a sport called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's a martial art. It's a ton of fun. It's kind of like wrestling if you don't know what that is. Uh, but essentially, uh, it's a sport. And back in the day, back uh, I was like a late teenager, I would compete uh, all over the state and I would go to different competitions. And I went to this one competition, which was again in New York City. And this was one of the most prestigious competitions like in the world. Like some of the top named guys around the world were, were there at the this competition watching. So it was incredibly nerve wracking. And I, of course, was in a very low skill bracket, so I was not at the top of the world. Uh, but I went in to compete at this competition and it was a big deal. It was my biggest tournament I've ever competed in and I was really nervous about it and I wanted to make sure I did really well. And the night before, you go to the, the place that you're gonna compete at and you weigh in and you get your weight to make sure that you made weight and everything like that. And then afterwards, you usually go out to eat because you don't care about your weight anymore after you weighed in, you go out to eat. So I went with a group of guys from my gym and we were out there, like I said, in New York City and they wanted to go the night before a competition, they wanted to go to like a Mexican Asian fusion restaurant right before the night of our competition. And I'm like, guys, I'm not sure this is a good idea. Like I know that anything I eat off that menu is gonna make me absolutely hate my life the next day. This is not gonna be a fun experience whatsoever. My stomach can't handle that. I don't think that's a good idea but they were really adamant about going. I was like, guys, bad idea. Am I the only one who sees this right now? So I was like, guys, I'm not gonna do this. This is a, I'm gonna throw up tomorrow. This is not good. And eventually I convinced them we didn't go. And the problem was after that moment, they dubbed me as Picky Steve for the rest of my life. So now, years later, after I go, every time I go to the gym, they call me Piggy Steve. In fact, this was such a big deal for them for some reason that the next day when we did compete, I, I competed against a, a kid who his coach was the world champion, the world champion. And I competed against this kid and I did really well. I did really well and I was super proud of myself, but they didn't care. They just called me Picky Steve the whole time. They didn't once compliment how well I did. They didn't once talk about the things I did right. They say, hey, Picky Steve, how are you doing around here today? And I was like, what the heck, guys? Why, why is this now the thing that I, I, I'm known by? Why is this the thing that you guys are calling me when I did all of these other things? And here's, here's my point in this. I think, I think that as followers of Jesus, we should be known more by what we are for than what we are against. We should be known by what we are for more than what we are against. And here's why I think that. This is found, again, continuing in verse seven, it says this, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. God has set us up to be an alternative to the world. Kerry Newhoff, who is a former pastor and a Christian author, says, an exhausted culture needs an alternative to itself, not an echo of itself. So what is this alternative? What are we supposed to do and who are we supposed to be? What's supposed to set us apart when facing opposition? And I want you guys to get this before I get into this, that the story of the gospel is laced in every single aspect of this passage. And I think there's four different things that this passage calls us to do. And it can be easy at first to think that these are just rules that we have to complete in order to make ourselves feel better or to get in right relationship with God. But I want you to know as we go through this, that the story and the message of the gospel is laced in every aspect of this passage. So what are we supposed to do? Number one is this, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply. Can we just be honest? Oftentimes our world rejects Jesus, not because of Jesus, but because of us. Oftentimes they reject Jesus because honestly, we can be mean sometimes, we can be arrogant, we can be judgmental. 
And whether that's fair or not, that, that's true. God calls us to love people deeply. And that includes the people we disagree with on Facebook. It includes the people we disagree with politically. It includes the people who look different, think different, act different, live different, to love each other deeply. Why? So that we can feel better about ourselves? No, but because is that not what Jesus did for us? That he loved us deeply. We were different, we were opposed to him, and he decided that I am going to love you no matter what. Number two is this, show hospitality. And hospitality is more than simply being kind to somebody or showing, or showing some kind of encouragement. It is welcoming somebody into your life, into your home, into your heart, and showing them that you have a place here, you are safe here with me, I am going to love you no matter what. Doesn't matter if you look different than me, if you think differently, I'm going to accept you into my heart. Even this, even this, if they are heaping abuse on me, I'm going to welcome them into my life. Why? Because we feel like it's a good thing to do? No, because is that not what Jesus did for us? To show hospitality. Number three is this, serve others. The church is not supposed to be a place where we go and get the things that we want, where we get the things that we can get out of our own power, out of our own manipulation. We are supposed to be a place where we put others' needs before us. We say, my needs are not as important as your needs. And we go out and we serve and we love people. In fact, Mark chapter 10, 45 says, for even the son of man, even Jesus himself did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are called to go forward, to use our gifts, our talents, to put others, people's needs before us. This is how we are to react in a world that opposes the Christian faith. And number four is this. I love this one. Speak the very words of God. Speak what is true, speak what is right, speak what is encouraging, speak what is life and love, speak justice, speak, speak through the power of the Holy Spirit, not through my own words, not through the, the things that I think are clever in my own heart, but speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit, because this is who Jesus was. This is what Jesus did, and he calls us to live in that same way. And why do we do all this? Why do we love? Why do we show hospitality? Why do we serve? Why do we speak the words of God? Get this, in verse 11, it says that, so in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. I'm gonna read that again. To him be the power and the glory forever and ever. Ever. Amen. This is why we do the things that we do, so that the name of Jesus can be made great. So that when people see us, they don't see Calvary Assembly, they don't see a church, they don't see uh, an organization, they see the name of Jesus. Our world needs to know that there is someone greater, there is someone better, that there is someone who brings joy and fulfillment and peace. There is something greater than the things that they have been living for, and we cannot, I can't, we cannot accomplish that if our only goal is to avoid rejection and if our only goal is to get the things that we, what we want. There is power and surrender to the name of Jesus, and in everything we do, to make his name great. Man, if the only thing I do in my life is make my name great, the only thing I do in my life is to make people remember the things that I can do or say or whatever, man, that's a wasted life. But if our goal is to make the name of Jesus great, that's what changes. So I'm gonna have the worship team come out here. I'm gonna ask you guys to, to bow your heads and, and close your eyes. I want you to reflect on these things. Number one, are you burnt out and exhausted because uh, people uh, have been mocking you, heap abuse on you? Have you been feeling the temptation to, to fit in or compromise because of the way that you have been living? And I'm gonna encourage you with this. Continue to be faithful. Continue to be faithful to the name of Jesus. Don't lose heart. What you are doing, though you may not see the fruit now, makes a difference. Continue to be faithful to the name of Jesus. Number two is this. There's some, there could be some of us who are, who are feeling the pressure to compromise on the things that, that we believe. And there may be some of you who may be feeling, hey, I know that there's things in my life that don't match up with the way that Jesus has called me to live. I want to encourage you that King Jesus is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to surrender your 
your life to. He is worthy to bring you the peace and the joy and fulfillment that you cannot achieve on your own. Right now, you are trying desperately to find some type of peace, some type of freedom from anxiety, some type of, of joy and fulfillment, so you will do whatever it takes to find that. But if you've ever lived that way, you know it is fruitless. Can I tell you this right now, that the name of Jesus is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to give your life to. So if that's you today, there is more joy in Jesus. There's more peace in Jesus. There's forgiveness of sins in Jesus. And it doesn't require you to be a good person. All it means is that you will surrender to him and say, Jesus, you can have my heart. You can have my life. You can have everything about me because I trust you. And it's not an easy thing. It's not easy to do that but I promise you that once you do the name of Jesus comes through so if that's you today I encourage you identify those areas of the places where you feel like fitting in and as we worship engage in prayer and we're gonna sing a song that says there's no other name there is no other name worthy to be praised and that is the heart posture that we are supposed to be taking as followers of Jesus that there is no other name in my life that I will give my praise to that I will give my heart to will you stand and sing that there is no other name than Jesus